Things Fall Apart is Chinua Achebe's debut novel, published in 1958. It depicts pre-colonial life in southern Nigeria as well as the late 19th century arrival of Europeans. It is sometimes referred to as the prototype modern African novel written in English, and it was one of the first to achieve great critical acclaim. It is a required textbook in African schools and is widely read and taught across the English-speaking world. The book's title criticizes Western materialism and the white man's ignorance of Africans and their culture. The title relates to a verse from the poem The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats. Okonkwo is a wealthy warrior from the Umuofia tribe in southern Nigeria. He is also a champion in wrestling, having beaten a wrestler known as Amalinza the Cat due to his inability to fall on his back. He is haunted by his weak and wasteful father, Unoka, who died in shame, leaving several local debts unpaid. To ensure his family's survival, Okonkwo became a clansman, a warrior, and a farmer, among other things. He has a 12-year-old son named Inwoye, whom he regards as lazy. Okonkwo fears that Inwoye could follow in the footsteps of Unoka. Additionally, he is obsessed with being a real man, and any little deviation from this image is not permitted. As a result, he often abuses his wife and children and is abrasive toward his neighbors. The Umuofia get a virgin and a 15-year-old boy via a trade with another tribe. Okonkwo gets custody of the child, Ikamefana, and finds an exceptional son in him. Inwoye, too, forms an immediate relationship with the newcomer. Despite his affection for Ikamefana and the fact that the child begins to address him as father, Okonkwo refuses to offer him any sympathy, fearful of showing vulnerability. When Okonkwo accuses his youngest wife, Ajiugo, of being lazy during the week of peace, he hits her fiercely, disrupting the Holy Week's tranquility. He makes some concessions to demonstrate his regret, but he has left his people in a state of shock that will never be forgotten. Ikamefana lives with Okonkwo's family for three years. Inwoye regards him as an older brother and assumes a more manly demeanor, much to the joy of Okonkwo. The locusts arrive day and return annually for the following seven years, until they disappear for another generation. Locals eagerly gather them because they are delectable when cooked. Okonkwo is told in private by Ogberfi Eziudu, a well-known village elder, that the oracle has ordered the assassination of Ikamefana. He instructs Okonkwo that since Ikamefana addresses him as father, Okonkwo should abstain from taking part in the boy's murder. Okonkwo informs Ikamefana that he must be sent to his ancestral village. Inwoye's eyes flood up. As he travels with the men of Umuofia, Ikamefana contemplates meeting his mother. After several hours of journey, Okonkwo's clansmen attack the boy with machetes. Ikamefana runs towards Okonkwo for aid. Disregarding the oracle's warning, Okonkwo murders the child in front of his tribe. When Inwoye returns home, he deduces that Ikamefana has died. Okonkwo succumbs to despair, unable to sleep or eat. He pays a visit to his friend Obirika and immediately feels better. Azinma, Okonkwo's daughter, is ill but recovers when her father collects leaves for her treatment. The ekwe, a musical instrument, is used to inform surrounding villages about Ogberfi Azedu's death. Since Ezudu last visited Okonkwo to tell him not to take part in Ikamefana's murder, Okonkwo feels guilty. During Ogberfi Ezedu's elaborate and expensive funeral, the boys bang drums and shoot weapons. The tragedy becomes even greater when Okonkwo fires his gun, killing Ogberfi Ezedu's 16-year-old son. Okonkwo is forced to exile his family for seven years in order to atone for killing a clansman, which is considered an act against the soil goddess. He gathers his most prized items and journeys with his family to Imbanta, the birthplace of his mother. 
to cleanse the community of Aconquo's sin, the men from Ogberfi Azedu's quarter burn his dwellings and butcher his livestock. Aconquo's family, most notably his uncle, Ikendu, enthusiastically greet him. They aid him in the construction of a new housing complex and provide him yam seeds to start a farm. Despite his profound dissatisfaction with his situation, Aconquo accepts life there. Obiarika brings multiple bags of cowries, which are shells used as money, collected from selling Aconquo's yams during Aconquo's second year of exile. Obiarika plans to continue doing so till Aconquo is reunited with his village. Additionally, Obiarika relays the distressing news that the white man has destroyed another community, Abame. Six missionaries are then sent to Imbanta. Mr. Brown, the missionary's leader, speaks with the indigenous people via Mr. Kiaga, an interpreter. He informs them that their gods are unreal and that worshipping more than one god is an improper type of devotion. On the other hand, peasants cannot comprehend how the Holy Trinity can be recognized as a single god. Mr. Brown forbids meddling from his people despite the fact that his purpose is to convert Umuofia's residents to Christianity. Mr. Brown becomes ill and is replaced soon thereafter by Reverend James Smith, a stern and unforgiving man. The fervent converts are relieved to be freed of Mr. Brown's timid demeanor. One of them, called Enoch, takes the risk of uncovering an egwugu during the annual rite honoring the soil deity, an act akin to murdering an ancestor ghost. The next day, the Egwagu set fire to Enoch's living quarters and Reverend Smith's church. The district commissioner is incensed by the demolition of the church and requests a meeting with Umuofia's leaders. Once gathered, the leaders are arrested and imprisoned, where they face insults and physical violence. Following this, the clansmen convene for a meeting. Five court emissaries arrive and instruct the clansmen not to act. Aconquo assassinates their leader with his sword, expecting his tribe members to join him in revolt. When the other messengers are let go, Aconquo realizes that his tribe is averse to battle. When the district commissioner visits Aconquo's compound, he learns that Aconquo has hanged himself. The commissioner is escorted to the body by Obiarika and his friends. Obiarika continues by stating that suicide is a grave offense, and hence none of Aconquo's clansmen are permitted to touch his body. The commissioner, who is now working on an African history book, believes Aconquo's insurrection and subsequent demise would make an interesting paragraph or two. He's already settled on a title the pacification of the Lower Niger's primitive tribes. If you have any suggestions of which book I should summarize, please let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.